This video is brought to you by my homemade tape recorder, which has definitely seen better days. Welcome to Tube Time on Cool Dude Clem's Electronic Workshop. I'm going to have another attempt at making the plasma flame generator and I'm going to try a few circuits that I've come up with. Now I don't expect to get breakouts in this particular, in these particular experiments. This is just some low power tests that I'm going to do. Although if I do that's going to be really nice but um, mainly what we're going to do or mainly what I'm going to do is I'm going to build the circuit up Take some readings on the scope and, uh, yeah, we'll even see if we can get some RF to light up a compact fluorescent light bulb. Anyway, enough waffle. Let's do something. So, as some of you know, I'm going to revisit the plasma, plasma flame generator. I will get it out. And I've spent the last couple of days or so winding coils and building the base on where everything is going to be built, you know, put onto. And these are the coils I'm going to use. So I decided that rather than just make two coils and hope for the best, I'll make a whole bunch of them and see which ones work best. So, got one here with 15 turns, one with 20 turns, one with 25 turns, one with 37.5 turns, and this one which has 50 turns. Now, I know I said I wanted 100 turns, but 50 turns is about as much as I can get on a new roll, so uh, that's what we're going with, and I think that's going to be a much better option anyway. Now, you might have noticed that this looks a bit scuffed and a bit bleh, but that's actually intentional, because about every two turns, I've scraped the insulation away, so I can stick a pin in there or whatever, and make a connection, and I can find the best turns ratio to see what works best. And here's our GU50 tube. And the more observant of you might have noticed something. On the base of the tube here, I put spring terminals so I can connect this up nice and easily. So I've been thinking about how I'm going to lay all the parts out. And I think this is going to be the best option. So I'm going to start with this one as my choke coil. This one as my output coil. And I'm going to use a ferret core to adjust the inductance of the choke and we'll see we'll see if it works so these are the circuits I'm going to test I've got this one here which has two coils so we have a choke coil and an output coil a couple of things I need to go over is that I'm not going to be using a one microfarad capacitor here because I've got a couple of 180 microfarad 400 volt capacitors which I'm going to use I'm going to use one of them in there or I might use something else haven't really decided yet and this is the other circuit that I'm going to try that just uses one coil. Now I know I've said 50 turns and 50 turns there, but I couldn't get 50, um, I couldn't get 100 turns onto a toilet roll, so uh, this is going to be just one 50 turn winding with a center tap at 25 and then 23 and then 21 and so on. And I'm going to try and find the best turns ratio. Also in this experiment, I'm going to try a couple of different configurations. So, here we've got the valve with all three grids connected to the antenna. And if this works, which I don't think it will, but if it does work, that's going to make things a lot easier because there's going to be a much less com component count. We're not going to need the capacitor or the resistor in this circuit or the resistor and the capacitor in this circuit. And this is another configuration I'm going to try, like this one, except then um, grid 3 is connected to the cathode where it normally is. And lo, it is done. Now if you're wondering what these capacitors are, they're just to smooth what's going into grid 2. The question is, just how am I going to power this thing? And do you know there's a party going on outside just because it was sunny today? Yeah, let's take a listen.
I don't know who that is. And that's not my neighbour because uh, I don't think he's there right now. Now I know what you're thinking. Why did I use valves? Well, I could use something much smaller and much more modern. Well, the thing is with valves, unlike transistors, they're a lot more forgiving. They're not likely to explode if something goes wrong. So I want to power it from mains, but obviously I don't want to have it directly connected to the mains. I want some kind of isolation in there, so that's where these two transformers come in. So I've got mains coming out here, then 26O and 26 coming out of this transformer. Then I've got half of that going into this transformer's 26 volt winding, so we should get about 120 volts out of this. Then I'll try it at 240 volts, which means, you know, the full voltage is gonna, from this transformer is going to go into this transformer, and then get stepped up to 240 volts in this transformer. I know I'm kind of waffling here. And then I want to try it on double mains voltage and see what we get. Just want to do a little experiment first. So this is a little experimental circuit I've got set up on the breadboard. So I've got the output from a transformer connected here. And here we've got a full bridge rectifier, as Electro Boom would say. And that's connected to two capacitors in series. And then we've got our outputs. And you might have noticed that there is a switch here. So with that switch open, it's just going to give normal rectified DC output. But when I put this switch down, or close the switch, or whatever you want, however you want to say it, we should get double the voltage out of this. And here's the circuit with a, um, you know, full, um, bridge rectifier package. So I've got AC going in here, a positive, a negative, a two capacitors, a switch. Hey, yeah, it's the same circuit. Doesn't really matter if the switch is connected to here or here, it'll still work. This is actually um, in a lot of PC power supplies, you see this? So when the switch is up, you use, that's how you, um, that's how it would be if you're operating on 240 volts, and if the switch is down, that's how you use it on 120 volts, because then that would double the voltage to what it would be if you're powering it on 240 volts, which is what the computer's power supply works on, so uh, let's see how well this works on the breadboard. Well, I'm a bit pissed off at the moment because I recorded a whole section of this video not realising that the camera was paused the whole time and was only recording when I thought it was paused so all I got was me putting the camera down. But anyway, this is the circuit set up on the breadboard and I'm using the green wires on this transformer which give out about 9 volts. And uh, let's just uh, try to work out what voltage we're actually going to get from that, so... Um, vintage blast from the past 1970s calculator meter. So, 9 volts times 1.41. Okay, 12.69, then we've got to take into account the voltage drop across the diodes, which is going to be about 1.2 volts. So we should have about 11.49 volts. And we double that when we close the switch. Let's just see what that's going to give us. About almost 23 volts. Well, let's see if those calculations are correct. So, the circuit set up. Got a little bit of residual voltage in those capacitors, but let's turn this on and see what works. I mean, See what happens. Why does my brain always melt when I start recording? I might see a little flash in the bulb when we turn it on. Okay, maybe not. Uh, yeah, that seems to be working about right. Of course, I don't expect it to be dead on what I calculated. But we have about 11.5 well, volts. Alright, so, let's close the switch, quote-unquote, and see what voltage we get. In fact, let's get that on there. And yeah, look at that. We've now got double the voltage. Well, it is all set up and ready for its first test run. I don't know if it's going to work. But that's what we're going to find out. So I'll just take you for, through a little talk through it. 
So, got our two transformers providing the high voltage. So, this one inputs mains and outputs low voltage. This one takes vol low voltage and outputs mains voltage, just for isolation. At the moment I've got this wired so it will output about 120 volts. Then we've got this rectifier which will rectify that to about 170 volts DC. Then there's the circuit itself. Inside this piece of heat shrink I have a ferrite bar if you can see that. So I can adjust the inductance of this coil. So when I measured them, this coil was about 42 microhenry and this one is about 36 microhenry. And with the, if I can get that in there, all the way in that's about 90 microhenry. And of course we have the transformer to power the filament of the tube. Will it work? Will it destroy my computer? Will it uh, go up in smoke? Well, um, I guess we'll find out. Now, I thought I had some high voltage rectifiers, but I don't. This one here is only rated for up to 600 volts, so we'll only be able to do the 170 volt and 340 volt test for now, but um, if this works, I'll see if I can find a way to make that voltage higher. Well, you know I just can't help myself. I was going to wait until the stupid sun goes down so I can actually film this better with the lights on, but um, anyway, while the tube's warming up, I've got the scope ready. This piece of wire connected to it just to act as an antenna to pick up any RF. Also, I've got this bulb as an RF detector. Now, I don't think it's going to do much at 170 volts input. And I've got a switch connected to this transformer. Well, micro switch. Let's see if we do get any oscillation. And I did see something on the scope just then. I think we'll have to go back just a little bit with our... It does oscillate, and that's quite a quite long decay when I turn the power off, so... Uh, that's not consuming much power at all. Turn the scope up just a little bit. Nice waveform. At about 14 megahertz. So now it's oscillating. So what I intend to do is try this with the ferrite rod and try a couple of different choke coils. See what kind of effect that has on the output. I'm not going to film all of it, of course. And then I'll take the best results and see if we can get a flame out of that. Okay, so I've tried this with the ferrite rod inserted. And it really doesn't seem to make any difference if this is 30 whatever microhenry or 90. So, I'm going to put that to the side for now. I think what we need now, though, is more voltage. So here we are about to test at 340 volts. And hopefully this is going to shield everything against the intense RF that's going to come off this thing. But we're just going to go over to the scope. I've got the wire going through there and to there, so we've got the antenna. Let's just turn it on and see... Okay, that was at 340 volts, but now let's try it with a 25 turn coil as our ballast, I mean choke. This is the one I was using. It's 36, um, 37.5 turns. The output coil is 50 turns. For those of you curious. Let's see if this works. I'm going to observe the scope. Oh, it's about the same. Frequency hasn't shifted. Amplitude hasn't shifted. I'm now going to stick my ferrite rod into the coil. See if that makes any difference. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe the amplitude is a bit higher. But, um, so, our output frequency is really being governed by the output coil. Right, so I'm going to try the other circuit now. So... This coil is now our choke and our output coil combined into one. So, 
got our B plus going into the bottom of the coil. Then here, where this pin is, if we go right in close to that, you might be able to see that the pin is making contact with the exposed part of the wire. And that is going to pin 6 on the tube, which is our anode. Now my prediction, if this is making a good connection that is, is that we're going to see double the frequency on the scope. Let me just turn that on. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go along all the possible connections here and see which one gives us the best output. Circuit's warmed up, I mean tubes warmed up rather. Let's see if it does anything. Okay, well, the frequency was a lot higher. The output was a lot lower, but the frequency was a lot higher. We got 25 megahertz. So now what I want to do, is just go down every single possible every possible connection there and see what gives us the best output. We're really not getting much out of this one. It seems that the center point is where we get the most output, but um, if I go up from there or if I go down from there, we get less output. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put this back into its original configuration and then I'm going to try the tube in different configurations. Okay, so we're back to our original configuration. For some reason my camera thinks that this is a face, I don't know why, but um, before I do anything else, I just want to say that we're definitely getting RF, that's for sure. I don't trust the weather forecast anymore. It said it was going to be cloudy, and it says it's cloudy, so what do we get? Sun. The weather forecast right now says it's going to be cloudy and showers tomorrow. So what will we get? Sun. We well, have to excuse the appalling lighting conditions, but because even though the weather said it's going to be cloudy today, and instead we get sun, that means I don't want to have the lights on when the sun's out. Anyway, I have now got this configured in the triode configuration. Well, one of the triode configurations. This one, in fact. So that means I no longer need these capacitors here anymore. And I've no idea if this is going to work like this. You know, I've got grid 1 and 2 connected to the um, feedback antenna. Not if it's even going to work. But let's try it. Let's see if we get anything on the scope. And, uh... Okay, nothing this time. So I think it's time to try it in the other triode configuration. Okay, so now all three grids are connected together and of course connected to the feedback antenna. Well, there is a resistor which offers a little bit of load resistance, but... So let's see if this works. It probably won't, but we can hope. So it turns on. And yep, no response from the oscilloscope. Okay, so we know which configuration works the best, which configuration works not so well, and which configuration doesn't work at all. The best one being the one with the two coils, and grid 2 getting its power through a couple of resistors and then smoothed by the capacitors. And yes, before anybody points it out, I know it's not a good idea to have capacitors right next to a source of heat, but... Since this is just an experimental circuit, I really don't think that's going to matter. And the best configuration, according to all my experimentation, is the dual coil configuration, which would help if I was pointing the camera at it, so I should really look through the viewfinder more. And the best coils to use are this one here, which is 37.5 turns, and this one here, which has 50 turns. It works even better when I put a ferrite rod in there. Now, I might actually do some experimentation with another choke, but that's going to be in another video. Also, in the next video, this is going to be powered not from rectified mains voltage, but from doubled mains voltage. So that's going to be about 650 volts. And then, we're going to step this up to a microwave oven transformer. 
Now, I didn't show it in the video, but um, I was actually able to draw a very small arc off the end of the wire there, which I wasn't even able to do with the other circuit that didn't work, even when powering it off a microwave oven transformer, so this is already working better than the other circuit ever did. But anyway, that's all going to be in the next video, so um, I'm going to go now, and until next time, goodbye.